Hi everyone, welcome to our fifth town hall. We are trying something a little different this time. We are live. For those of you who are watching us live, welcome. For those of you who are watching us later, it's going to be just as good, I tell you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today and uh, we have lots of questions that we plan on answering. Most of this is going to be about answering your questions. Um, I try to get out on the units every day. I try to hit every unit every day to answer your questions and I'm happy to do that. So when you see me on the units, please don't hesitate to come up and ask your questions. I welcome them. Even if they're hard questions and I don't know the answer, I know who to go to here, even though I wasn't supposed to touch him. Um, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Sangwal is, is uh, a great resource, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, broadcast, and uh, stick with us because we are sticking with you. I'm going to introduce Carol Smith, our Director of Human Resources. Alrighty, so I'll get started. I hope not to speak very long because it is all about the questions. Um, this will be about a half hour, so just be aware of that. I'll try to respect people's time, your time that, you're, is what, that are watching this, and our time as well. So let's get right to a couple of things. Um, I get a question very frequently about when the so-called surge will happen. The short answer is nobody really knows. Um, many of you are aware of what's going on in other cities and other countries, and that may or frankly may not be relevant to what actually happens in Los Angeles. Do know that we have some folks uh, at DHS, some experts, in modeling and this kind of a thing, and they're working with DHS leadership to try to help plan um, in their modeling um, data. I'm not familiar with those data right now, but just know that's happening. So I don't know when a surge will or even if will happen here. We'll see. Um, we are preparing for it, of course. I mentioned this in the last town hall, I think in every town hall. There is an extensive plan with a lot of leadership involved in very detailed planning about what will actually happen should a surge happen with regards to moving people, moving space, moving functions. So that's in hand should we need it. Um, pardon me for looking down, by the way. I've got some notes here, and I don't want to miss anything that you requested of us. Uh, there was a question about uh, clinical staff, or I should say non-clinical staff, doctors, nurses, and others that may not work routinely with patients. What will their role be in the event of a surge? And there is a plan for that as well. So stay tuned for that. But there will be no stone left unturned, I think it's fair to say. If we're in a surge situation, we will want to utilize all folks to the best of their ability after appropriate training for whatever needs may arise. Um, I want to mention something about N95 sterilization plan. You know we're in a shortage of N95s. We're doing well at the moment, um, but it is a week, a day-to-day, -day, week by week assessment. And should there be a situation where N95s are critically short, we're in process right now to develop a plan to sterilize them. Um, and right now, we're already starting to collect the N95s that you use. So as a reminder, you can use an N95 in a PUI or COVID patient's room, but once you come out of that room, uh, we are not reusing. Whereas if you go in any other room, you can reuse N95s. That's an existing policy. It's been around for a while. Uh, what we are n adding now is we want people to, if you use an N95 in any room, uh, to throw the N95, assuming it is not soiled or torn or otherwise destroyed, into a very specific N95 bin. And we've got this handy dandy sign, and Ross, if you could maybe focus on this, if people can't see it, maybe you can see it. These are going to be, or soon will be affixed to bins in many of the units. I think a couple days ago they went up to 27 units, and it's probably up to more by now. Please throw all N95s in here. Do not throw surgical masks. Do not throw trash as we've already witnessed. Please look at the signage and be cognizant of it. Uh, we want to save these for the moment until we finalize a sterilization plan, uh, which we're working on now at the DHS level. So that's for N95s only, not surgical masks. What else? Uh, scrubs. We have responded to the request for more scrubs. Leadership has um, already begun a distribution process through the ScrubX existing machine processes that we have to provide scrubs, particularly to those high-risk areas, um, whether it be the ED or RT or respiratory, other places. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, these are not scrubs, by the way. We have an existing scrub policies, policy pre-COVID. Uh, we don't want scrubs taken home. Uh, these are scrubs to be provided here in the institution and used in the institution. Uh, what else? Lab testing capability is a common question. 
Uh, as you know from our last town hall and maybe from other information you've received, we're doing pretty well right now with lab testing. We have outsourced uh, many, uh, almost all of our labs, uh, to very fast turnaround time testing sites at UCLA, at LA County USC, um, even Quest has a sort of a priority, a priority pathway. And we've been very lucky and fortunate that we've got our, gotten our turnaround times down to less than 24 hour, four hours in most cases. We have very specific alternate pathways for other specific needs. I won't uh, belabor now that are slightly longer turnaround time, but it, it doesn't matter um, for those specific situations. So we're doing pretty well with lab testing. We have two in-house machines that we're validating as we speak. Um, we do, however, have a relatively small number of tests to use in those machines, so we're going to be really uh, parsimonious about using the, our actual in-house lab testing. But we're, as I say, we're doing well now with our outside labs, so that's good. Uh, just FYI, the daycare center is in the part of the library. It's being uh, uh, carefully and credibly run by a lot of people here with our child life staff that are uh, uh, staffing it as we speak. I just wanted to announce that it's there. And number one, that it's also, as of I think today or yesterday, open to ACN staff uh, as well. And the last thing maybe I'll mention is uh, you may have heard or be, you may be aware that there's a boat. Uh, it's called the Mercy. It's uh, in the ocean <laughs> right next to us. And that boat has been provided uh, for us to be able to offload patients who are not COVID positive onto the Mercy. And they provide full care, including surgery. So we're doing some testing on patients in-house uh, who we do not believe have COVID, and then once we prove they don't have COVID, we send them to the Mercy. And that's been a great resource for us, and that will clear up space if and when we have a surge in our building. So that's going well. I will add that if any clinic, there's a whole Mercy, you may have the question, how do I consider, get my con patient considered to be transferred to the Mercy? There's a process which I believe is uploaded. Is that correct? Yes. Lavatia says yes. Um, it's a lovely two-page document. It tells essentially the attending clinician to call the MAC system. The case is presented to the Mercy staff. They say, yes, we'll take your patient, or no, we won't. If they say yes, the next call is to utilization review, and there are processes thereafter. So just know that it's on the Harbor Internet website. Okay, I don't uh, think I have any other things to note right now, so I want to uh, have Carol um, know whatever she would like to know with regard to human resources. Good afternoon. Currently, there was a letter that came out on April 3rd in regards to the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. I just want to make sure that everyone saw the DHS broadcast, and it refers to letting um, everyone know that at this time, this act only does not refer to DHS employees. As soon as we get additional information, we will let you know. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact HR at extension 64900. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right. Uh, next, uh, we have Erica Sweet sitting next to me here, who's the Director of Employee Health Services, and she's going to talk with you about a few things. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I want to talk to you about N95s and PAPRs or CAPR respirators. So a lot of people have been asking how do they know what type of N95 that they have already passed on for fit testing. If you know My Persinda, you go to My Persinda, click on My Information, there is a little mask icon and click on that and you will get a list of every respirator that you have ever been fit tested on during your employment at Harvard. If you have successfully passed one of these N95s and that respirator is available on your unit, you do not need refit testing. You have already passed that respirator. On each of the respirators, now that we have multiple different types on the floor, I would recommend that you look on the respirator for the size, the manufacturer, and the make. That is the key importance. If you, these all look the same, but they are actually different. So the, what you need to look is on the back side. This will give you the numbers and the size. If that matches your My Persinda, 
you can wear this respirator. The three M's are shaped a little bit different. They also have their lot, their um, make number on them. If you've passed on the specific model number, you are approved to use that model number. Now, if you have to wear a packer, we now have a, a new device called a capper. Uh, same concept, they're powered air purifying respirators. The cappers come with a, a face shield, it's called the disposable lens cover. And the first part is you look at the opening device. You place it directly on the clip and you flip it. Then you connect both sides and it is ready to go plug it in and you can wear it. Now when you re exit the room, your steps to remove the disposable lens cover is to take off both sides first and then flip the clip and it pops right off. Do not pull on it because it tends to break the clip. And that is it about respirators. So we talk about the fact that these are reusable. Um, all our pappers and cappers um, and face shields, basically, of any type. Are, we're trying to reuse them as much as possible, so we're allowing them to be disinfected. Um, and I will say that this can be difficult sometimes because it has this sort of plastic glove thing that we call, that we, that I call it. And um, so we attempt to disinfect this. Uh, we wash it with water to get some of the residue off to preserve the integrity of the material. But I will say that if any face shield or capper shield or any shield at all appears to you to have lost its integrity or will not provide the protection you require, toss it. But we are trying to save them and uh, uh, disinfect them. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about cappers I've heard about. I will just remind people, and we just had this great demonstration of cappers and how to put them on and off, but just remember N95s with a surgical, uh, excuse me, N95s with a face shield or goggles is equivalent protection, regardless of what you're doing. Now, we, there are groups in the hospital that are using cappers and pappers preferentially for certain procedures, and that is acceptable, so long as we have cappers, and so long as we, and we've had two break in the last week or so. So we're trying, they're precious, and they're fine to be used by certain groups. Just know, from a pure science perspective, there is no information out there that we're aware of that N95s plus say, eye protection is any better or worse than cappers or pappers. We've even gone so far as to call the company. Do they have any data that these things are superior to N95s? And they do not. Uh, we've gone to Cal OSHA, we've gone to C uh, CDPH and a lot of other uh, organizations with uh, numerous letters. And none of them uh, rec overtly recommend that pappers or cappers are superior to the N95 and eye protection approach. Uh, just to be aware of that. Um, Eric, I'm going to ask you also to comment on um, where we are with healthcare worker testing if they're symptomatic. Okay, so currently, if you are, are identified as an employee who had a known occupational exposure confirmed by the infection team and you are symptomatic, we will test you through our drive-through model. It's underneath the heliport. Employees that are symptomatic that do not have a known exposure are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis for possible testing. Do you want to mention the risk exposure grid and how sure. we use that? Okay, so we, uh, if you have a occupational exposure, you, you present to employee health and we will stratify your risk on what type of protective equipment you were wearing with when you had contact with the patient and what type of activities you were doing with the patient. So if you were doing an aerosol generating procedure without a, any type of mucous membrane protection, so not, no eye protection, no uh, respirator, no face mask, you're gonna be categorized as a high risk and will require 14 days of home isolation and self-monitoring twice a day. If you were in the room uh, and there was not an aerosol generating procedure and you walked in and delivered a tray without a respirator or a face shield or a mask, that is considered low risk and you will be asked to continue your self 
uh, monitoring twice a day, but there are no work restrictions. I think it's worth reemphasizing that point. If, if we, we're getting a lot of questions, Erica and myself and others. Um, I walked, I, I was exposed somehow to either a PUI or a COVID positive patient or a possible COVID posi positive patient. And what do I do? And just to reiterate, if you're asymptomatic, um, you will be allowed to work and we will ask you to self-monitor with twice a day fever te uh, temperature checks and symptom monitoring. And Erica has this great diary. Uh, it's a one pager, I think is up on the website. Risk exposure grid that she just mentioned is also up on the website um, because it's a lot of detail. But I, again, I think my most common question is, um, is exactly that. I had exposure to this person over there who was later found to be COVID positive. What do I do? If you're asymptomatic, it's come to work, uh, wear a mask, actually. Um, do the diary, which is twice daily temperature check and symptom check, and, um, and that's it. Should you develop any symptoms, we ask that you not come to work or leave work, and uh, there's a whole other process for that. So just to remind people of that. Um, okay, before I forget, I want to advertise the handy dandy dashboard, which uh, I put up here last time. This happens every day. And I'll just reiterate for those of you that don't know or didn't see it last time or don't have not looked open this particular email, the dashboard is created by uh, the administration. It's got a lot of useful information that people I think want to know in general. It's got how many PUI persons of, uh, under investigation we have. These are people who come in with symptoms we believe may be consistent with COVID that have not been proven to have COVID yet. P PUIs, persons under investigation. The number here at Harbor and the number of DHS. Um, and also the number of staff that have been tested here. We've also got sort of a traffic light gizmo over here that shows the um, uh, availability of various PPE, including masks, N95, small and regular surgical masks, face shields and goggles. And let's see, this is our assessment of blood supply, which at the, as of yesterday was good. Uh, medication supply, there were some challenges with uh, certain drugs, which is listed right here. Uh, this is just data right from the uh, Department of Public Health LA County website on cases that message over here that we're on. Okay, we're back. I apologize for that inconvenience, although you didn't have to look at our faces for a few minutes. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> All right. So there are a few more questions I'll address here that came in, just random questions. Uh, there was a question uh, that we talked about last time, but it's a good one still. Uh, what about mild, can you have mild disease with COVID? Uh, we hear such horrible things about COVID and we see pictures in the media. Yes, you can absolutely have mild disease with COVID. We're very aware of several patients who have COVID and have upper respiratory complaints, even lower respiratory complaints with fever, and they're better in a day or two. That absolutely happens. Um, and then the question is, do you develop immunity? That is, <clears throat> if you have an infection and you get better, are you protected against subsequent exposure to the virus? That's called immunity. And the answer is we don't know. Uh, we do know that um, if I, we test someone two, three, four weeks after they were symptomatic with COVID, and we do a blood test, they may have the uh, appearance of having an antibody develop. An antibody is just a protein that fights against infection. However, we don't know yet with COVID if having that antibody is protective against subsequent exposure, as we do with other infectious diseases. So yes, you can develop immunity in your blood. We don't know yet if it protects you should someone expose you to COVID the next day. Just don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, what else? We got some questions about, some of you have heard about uh, what are called KN95s. Uh, Erica just told us about N95s. There's another, we're diligently looking around and about for any number of companies that provide these that are certified by NIOSH, which is a CDC, uh, part of the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention, to certify their safety for our staff. We have come into the possession of something called K9, KN95s, which I believe are from China, um, which in and of itself is no problem at all, but the problem is those masks are not certified by NIOSH here in this country. And there's a real process that these things are evaluated for their safety and protective capacity for staff. So we have K95s, some of them, in our possession. We do not want to use them at the moment because we don't know if they're safe yet. Now, if we reach, to be perfectly honest about it, if we reach some crisis situation and there's some big surge, 
and we have no N95s, we will probably use them. And they may be just fine. <clears throat> but right now, um, we're not using them because we're not 100% sure today. And let's see, I already talked about the blood test. There was a question about that. Um, I actually don't think I have any more questions. I do. All right. Tell us about, should we recommend testing asymptomatic employees or patients? Right. So that's a great question. And we get that a lot. Um, I was exposed to someone, and I'm, I'm not symptomatic right now, but I'm fearful about it, and that, that makes perfect sense. So the answer is no. We're not testing asymptomatic folks, staff or patients or anybody really, nor is, and nor is that the standard really nationally. And there are a couple reasons for that. Um, probably the main reason is if we do a test on, on someone who is asymptomatic and that test is negative, I don't really know what that test means. It could be that they don't have COVID. That would be fabulous. Could mean that they have COVID, but there isn't enough, enough viral replication in their nose to be detectable by the test that we use. So the test might be a false negative, i.e. they are infected, but we get a negative and we don't know what to do with that information and provides false sense of security to the person that we just tested. Oh, you don't have COVID, don't worry about it, but I'm not a thousand percent sure. If the test is positive, that's helpful. The other part of that coin is our capacity and our prioritization of whom we test. So we have only so many swabs, which is actually on the dashboard. Um, more importantly, we have only so many tests in the laboratory to run. And we, of course, are prioritizing our sickest patients. We're prioritizing our healthcare workers who are symptomatic because we need to do that for them. And it also has critical workforce issues. Um, if we suddenly have all our workforce sort of waiting for tests or tested and they're asymptomatic and we uh, send them home, suddenly we don't have anybody to, to practice and care for our patients. So we don't test because we don't know 100% what to do with the information. Uh, the science isn't there yet as to how long before you become symptomatic you actually will have virus detected or detectable. And also we have limited supply and we're focusing on um, healthcare workers and the sickest patients. And it also has significant implications when we test our sickest patients from an infection prevention standpoint that if we test the patient out of the emergency department, let's say, who's ill and has been targeted to go to the ICU for a PUI, a possible COVID positive patient, but we test, test them and we determine they're not infected, then we can put that patient somewhere else. We can free up a bed for a COVID patient from an isolation perspective and a PPE's perspective. So there are a lot of good reasons, I think, why we don't currently test asymptomatics. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, I have a follow-up question with them. So if I test positive, do I need to be retested before I can return to work? Right, it's a great question. So the short answer is no. Uh, if you're test positive, you are going to go home and you're going to be uh, restricted to home for 14 days. Um, seven. Seven days, excuse me. Thank goodness you're here. What it is in seven days, it's a minimum of uh, uh, seven days since the onset of symptoms and it's at least three days when your symptoms are gone and you haven't, been fe uh, you haven't had a fever for at least three days. So if you're COVID positive, you're home for a minimum of seven days. Um, we're not recommending repeat testing in that setting. You might say, well, gee whiz, why don't you just test me on day two? And if I'm negative and I'm fine, why can't I just come back? Well, the reason is we don't know, the science isn't there yet. We don't know of 100 people who are COVID positive and we test them every day with symptoms. Day one, day two, day three, they get better. Day four, day five, day six, day seven. We don't know what that curve looks like. And I will tell you in the, in nationally, there are reports of folks who have had virus detected up to at least a week, excuse me, four weeks after their symptoms have abated. Now, does that mean they're contagious for four weeks after their symptoms have abated? No, because remember what the test is. It's a test that detects <clears throat> genetic material, RNA, in the virus itself. Whether that virus is dead, whether that virus is chopped up to a million pieces, we happen to detect a bit of it. So we don't know if that virus detected, as I said, at two, three, four weeks after symptoms became, came and went, is infectious, transmissible, important. So we don't recommend testing after the initial positive. We recommend that you go home, that you get better, um, and that's what we do. Thank you. Anything else? Any comments from folks who are off camera? No? Okay. Well, let me thank you for your time. Let me thank the folks that are sitting here with me at the table and uh, others who are involved in making sure this thing gets out on the internet um, and for your questions. Uh, as I said last time and I'll say every time, um, there's really no point to doing a town hall unless we're giving you some useful information and we answer specific questions from specific people because I assure you that everyone who sends a question in, you're not the only one with that exact question. 
So with that, I think we'll sign off and look forward to next time.